know, one of the most common comments I get when I cover topics like longevity and anti-aging is that, see, you're only 28 years old. How can you talk about longevity and anti-aging? <laughs> well, to that, I commonly say that if you're going to ask the 100-year-olds what's the secret to their long life, then they're going to say some stuff like smoking a pack of cigarettes for 70 years every day or eating ice cream or chocolate every night. So you can't really rely on the information that the centenarians give you because they're not really scientists. And uh, of course, there's a lot of genetic factors that contribute to their great longevity. So my speech today is going to give you scientifically proven five ways to slow down the speed of aging. And when I'm talking about anti-aging or slowing down speed of aging, then I'm referring mostly to increasing health span, which essentially means adding healthy years to your life and being more functionally independent. So if you look at this graph, then the average person already starts to experience age rate decline already in their 30s and 40s. They start to experience back pain, different kinds of issues related to metabolism, different diseases, etc. And this is obviously not the most optimal way to age. On the opposite, if you are the kind of a person who maintains a healthy lifestyle, takes care of themselves, and also puts in effort with different kinds of biohacking techniques, then you can pretty much slow down this decline to a great degree and also add healthy years to your life, which is kind of the goal. And I'm going to share with you five key principles or activities that help you to achieve that. How do you are decades younger than your peers when you're 80 years old? And that's what I'm going to talk about. Principle number one is to have a higher VO2 max. VO2 max refers to cardiorespiratory fitness and maximal oxygen consumption. VO2 max is one of the biggest predictors of reduction in mortality risk. And based on studies, the individuals with the most extreme or the highest amount of VO2 max have up to four times lower risk of all-cause mortality than the lowest quartile of people in terms of VO2 max. And uh, this is obviously a very huge difference. Smoking generally increases your mortality risk by two to three times or 200%. If you're obese and you smoke, then that number is five times. But a low VO2 max being unfit, essentially, increases your mortality by four times. And, and if you really think about it for a moment, then being unfit, not having adequate... I'm not, and I'm not even talking about, you know, the most extreme level of VO2 max. You don't need to be an elite athlete. But being the lowest bottom, the lowest quartile of VO2 max increases your mortality risk by four times compared to the highest. And VO2 max is actually also a bigger predictor of mortality than strength. So in the biohacking community, it's pretty common knowledge that having some muscle and strength is important for longevity and slowing down aging. But VO2 max is actually a bigger predictor than muscle strength and muscle mass. So in this study, they looked at the differences between having either good strength or good VO2 max or combined both, having both the high VO2 max and high muscle strength as well. And in the middle, you have the reference group, which is having low grip strength, which is a measurement of overall muscle strength and low VO2 max as well. And compared to that group, the individuals who have the highest VO2 max and the highest grip strength combined have up to 47% reduction in their mortality. Whereas having even the highest grip strength but the lowest VO2 max, so being very strong but having poor cardio, only reduces your mortality by 29%. So, of course, it's better than nothing. And, you know, if you can choose one or the other, then you should, you know, you can't, if you, if you can't choose both, then head to head, having a higher VO2 max is better for reducing mortality risk than grip strength. But ideally, you want to combine both. You want to have good muscle strength and a high VO2 max. That's, give you, that's going to give you the biggest reduction in your mortality risk. 
Unfortunately, with age, you see a natural decline in your VO2 max. And this can happen at a degree of about 10% per decade, starting around in your 30s. But of course, the speed of your decline depends on how much effort are you putting in in maintaining your VO2 max and how fit and healthy you are overall. So in this study, they looked at the VO2 max of octogenarian athletes, so athletes who are in their 80s, so elderly athletes, and obviously they had a significantly higher VO2 max compared to the bottom uh, quartile, the fifth percentile, who have the lowest VO2 max, and the difference is quite high. So the line for dependency which means that you're pretty much disabled or you can't really function very well in your everyday life, that line starts around 5 metabolic equivalents or a VO2 max of 17.5, whereas the octogenarian athletes have a VO2 max of 39, and uh, that's 11 metabolic equivalents. So if you're below the 5 met line, which is 17.5 VO2 max, then that's chances are you're obviously have a very high risk of mortality, but also you're functionally less independent. So how fast your VO2 max declines with each depends on your pretty much your level of physical activity and fitness. So the average individual who stops exercising altogether, you can expect the decrease in your VO2 max to be even up to 15% per decade. If you maintain this weekend warrior fitness that you um, either do a little run on the weekend or you sign up for some sort of an event like a marathon, then your VO2 max is expected to decrease 10% per decade. But if you still maintain physical activity all throughout your lifetime, the older you get, then that drop is only 6% per decade. So the decline is inevitable. <laughs> like all of our fitness parameters and health parameters do decline with age, we can only slow it down. And the speed at which it slows down, uh, decreases depends pretty much on our health and fitness and how much physical activity are we able to maintain. So how, how high should your VO2 max be depends on your age and the group pretty much your age group, and uh, then you can be divided into, let's say, the degree of your fitness. And, you know, obviously the standards decrease with age, that's inevitable, but the highest reduction in mortality risk is if you're in the high VO2 max category or in the elite VO2 max category. And generally the magic number is going to be like 50 VO2 max. And uh, if to, to measure your VO2 max, then you would obviously have to go to a laboratory, do the VO2 max test. But you can also do it at home without going to the laboratory by assessing your current cardio. So if you can run a 5-kilometer run in 22 minutes, then that's generally the equivalent of a VO2 max of, 20, uh, of uh, 50. If you do the Cooper test, which is you run as long as or as um, far as possible in 12 minutes, then that's going to be 2,700 meters. That's a VO2 max of 50 generally. Or if you run one kilometer around four minutes, then that's also a sign of a VO2 max of 50. So how do you increase your VO2 max? VO2 max is obviously built with different kinds of cardio workouts. You do want to do this slow intensity cardio as well to build a good base for your aerobic capacity. But interval training has been also found to be very effective and more time efficient way of increasing the VO2 max. So here are like a few workouts that do increase your VO2 max. Number one is four rounds of four minutes near maximum effort at around 85 to 95% of your maximum heart rate, followed by four minutes of rest and you repeat it for four rounds. The other option is 10 rounds of one minute maximum effort followed by some rest and you repeat it for 10 rounds. Or lastly, an option is 45 minutes at 70% 70 of your maximum heart rate. And uh, the four minute intervals have been found to be the most effective, but they all 
do increase your VO2 max based on the graph, as you can see. Number two is going to be higher strength. So like we said, strength is still associated with reduction in mortality. And with age, you see a decrease in muscle mass and muscle strength. I'm pretty sure many people have seen this photo before. That's a real photo from an actual person, a scan. And uh, physical activity protects your body from becoming Wagyu beef. <laughs> so the photo in the upper right corner is a photo of a 74-year-old sedentary man who doesn't exercise. And as you can see, there's a lot of fat in that muscle tissue and uh, not a lot of that, mu not that much muscle. Whereas a 70-year-old triathlete has, you know, pretty much the same body composition as a 40-year-old athlete. As you can see the difference. With age, if you don't do anything, your muscles will deteriorate much faster and they're going to accumulate this intramuscular fat. Whereas if you have maintained a physical activity, then, you know, you can be literally three decades younger based on your muscle composition and muscle function if you maintain the physical activity. So losing muscle and having low muscle tissue and low muscle strength is also associated with increased mortality risk. And if you look at just having low muscle mass, so muscle tissue, that increases all-cause mortality by about 23 to 35%. If you just have low muscle strength, then that increases mortality risk by 98 to 182 percent. So head to head, losing strength is more important than muscle mass. If you have low strength, then that is worse for your mortality risk than having low muscle mass. But if you combine them together, having low muscle mass and, and low strength, which is a term called sarcopenia, then that increases your mortality risk by 93 to 194 percent. So again, Obviously, you want to have both muscle mass and muscle strength, but muscle strength appears to be significantly more important than muscle mass because low strength increases your mortality risk by 1.98 to 2.8 times compared to having appropriate muscle mass and muscle strength, whereas having low muscle mass does so only by 1.23 to 1.35 times. So having low strength is double the mortality risk than having just low muscle mass. And I think we can look at some like functional limitations in the uh, people between the ages of 45 to 68 with a 25 year old, uh, 25 year follow up. And here is just a list of different kinds of everyday activities that suffer if you're losing muscle strength. So as you can see, dressing, putting on clothes, if you have the lowest quartile of muscle strength, then that's two to three times greater risk of experiencing difficulty putting on clothes compared to the highest strength. And even going to the toilet, toileting is also around three times more likely to experience difficulties if you have the lowest strength compared to the highest strength. Eating, again, three times more likely to experience difficulties eating in the group of lowest strength and just e being able to get up from the chair, that increases, that risk is three to four times higher if you have lowest uh, muscle strength. So again, muscle strength is important for just everyday activities. Gardening, putting on clothes, going to the toilet, eating, rising up from a chair. If you have low muscle strength, then you're expected to have a hard time doing those everyday activities once you get older. And muscle strength also is a predictor of dementia. So people with the lowest strength, as assessed by grip strength, have up to 72% higher dementia risk compared to the highest strength group and 87% higher dementia mortality risk. So 87% more likely to die from dementia than the highest strength group. So sarcopenia... Like I said, it's a combination of low muscle strength and low muscle mass. And uh, your physical performance is ultimately going to suffer. That's the kind of clinical definition of sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss. How do you measure sarcopenia? So with a DEXA scan, 
that's a gold standard for assessing body composition and muscle mass. So it measures your appendicular lean mass, which is the muscle of the arms and legs. And if you're a man, the cutoff point for the appendicular lean mass is 7, 7 kilograms for males. And for women, it's 5.5. So if you're less than 5.5 or 7, then you have sarcopenia, pretty much. And uh, if you have higher than that, then you don't have sarcopenia. But, you know, higher is generally better <laughs> when it comes to the, you know, assessment of your mortality risk score if you do have sarcopenia or not. And uh, you can see from the graph as well, the 97th percentile of individuals, so the highest muscle mass and muscle strength, they don't decline as much as the lowest group. So you can easily slow down the rate of sarcopenia that happens with age inevitably with a good, let's say, lifestyle. How do you assess strength? So the easiest way to assess your strength levels is with a grip strength. So there are these dynometers where you squeeze and it measures your grip strength. That's a reflection of total body strength just with the grip. And your grip strength does decline with age. Generally, males have the highest strength around their 30s women in their 40s and you can pretty much from this graph it's in pounds but the highest quartile for males is going to be around 100 pound or sorry 100 kilo squeeze something like that you, if you've ever done the grip strength m machine then you, you know what I'm talking about but uh, that's a, like a very easy way to just assess if you have good strength or low strength compared to your age uh, group so how do you build strength? The easiest way to, or pretty much, you know, the, the most effective way to build strength is to do weightlifting. So different kinds of compound exercises. They're the biggest bang for your buck in terms of increasing lean muscle tissue, as well as increasing total body strength. But for the here, here it's important to say that you should never get injured because if you get injured, then you stop exercising and you can't exercise. And that's where the decline begins. So it's much more important to maintain the consistency even on a suboptimal exercise program than it is to have a very perfect program but then you get injured. <laughs> so you should definitely not get injured by lifting too many heavy weights or uh, just having poor form. So you should prioritize not getting injured. That's the most important thing for longevity at least. Principle number three is going to be being thin on the inside. So I'm not just talking about being obese or overweight. It goes layer deeper than that, uh, quite literally. When you look at BMI, so body mass index, then there is a very kind of clear association between different BMIs and mortality risk. So the lowest mortality risk for a BMI is between 20 to 25. If your BMI is above 30, which is categorized as class 1 obesity, then that is expected to reduce your life expectancy by 2 to 4 years. If your BMI is over 40, then uh, that is expected to reduce your life expectancy by 8 to 10 years. And usually the increased mortality risk association from having a BMI below 20, at least based on the studies, usually is due to the fact that like drug addicts or uh, alcoholics might have a low BMI. So it doesn't mean that having a lower BMI is somehow worse for you. It's just that it's epidemiological kind of noise <laughs> that uh, kind of confounds some of the results. If you have like a little bit of more muscle tissue, then your BMI might be 26, 27, which is normal. But if it's already above 30, then uh, that can be something to kind of look into. Maybe you have like a little bit of too body fat, for example. So the lowest mortality is still around 20 to 25, maybe below 30 is still safe. But one thing that is more important than BMI is the waist to hip ratio. So waist to hip ratio, you first measure with a measuring tape around the belly button. So that's your waist. And then you measure it around the hips, the widest point of your hips. You divide the number, you get a number. And having a higher waist to hip ratio is associated with increased mortality and increased cardiovascular disease. This is data from the World Health Organization. So for men's, so, so men, uh, the lowest risk is with a waist to hip ratio of 0 0.95. For women, 0 0.80. And the highest risk for men is 1. 
and for women 0 0.86. So yeah, you can just measure it at home, first around the belly button, then around the hips, you divide the waist number with the hip number and then you, you can see what's your general risk assessment. And the reason why a high waist to hip ratio is associated with increased mortality is because it's a reflection of internal fat. Like I said, you want to be thin on the inside. Fat around the organs and intramuscular fat is called visceral fat. And it's this kind of worst kind of fat because it starts to inhibit organ function. It starts to secrete these pro-inflammatory cytokines from the fat tissue into your bloodstream. You're going to get many other metabolic disorders because of that. So having too much in internal fat as seen by visceral fat is going to be bad for your heart disease risk and overall mortality. And the, let's say, medical condition that you're more likely to get with a very high waist to hip ratio is called metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is characterized by having three or more of the following conditions. Number one, high blood pressure. Number two, high waist circumference or a high waist to hip ratio. Number three, high triglycerides. Number four, high fasting glucose, and number five, low HDL cholesterol. If you have three or more, then you're diagnosed as with metabolic syndrome, and metabolic syndrome increases your heart disease risk by two times, and overall mortality risk by one to five times. How do you lose the visceral fat? There's multiple ways to do it, but the main, you know, there are different diets you can follow, but the main mechanism, or the main, let's say, driver of losing the visceral fat is going to be calorie restriction. Losing weight, being in an energy deficit, makes your body burn up the fat around the organs and inside the muscles. There is also evidence that intermittent fasting or following a fasting mimicking diet also helps to achieve that. But it's going to be mostly through reduction in calorie intake. If you want to really micromanage this, or if you're already following a calorie restricted diet, then you need to look into the glycemic index of the food and especially fructose. I'm not talking about fruit. I'm talking about the artificial high fructose corn syrup and just uh, industrial fructose that is associated with higher visceral fat accumulation and alcohol as well. Alcohol and fructose are pretty much the biggest drivers of uh, visceral fat accumulation. Resistance training is important. Reduction in st uh, stress and making sure that you sleep enough is going to be important because stress promotes visceral fat accumulation. And lastly, there is also evidence that green tea and different kinds of polyphenols may also like help to target specifically the belly fat and visceral fat around the liver. But fortunately, these things are also good for longevity. So calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, exercise, they work by activating your body's different longevity pathways like AMPK, autophagy, increasing NAD, and different other processes that keep your body young. So they're called these hormetic stressors. So you should want to be doing these things anyway, pretty much to slow down the speed of aging. And the outcome is that you lose also the visceral fat. Principle number four is going to be circadian rhythm or the day and night cycles. The issue here, here is that with age, you see a decline in the rhythmicity of the circadian hormones, primarily melatonin and cortisol. So cortisol is the stress hormone, but it's also the hormone that wakes you up in the morning and kickstarts many of the circadian processes. Melatonin is called the sleep hormone, but it's more than that. It's also the most powerful antioxidant in the body. And melatonin technically, at least in my opinion, is the main hormone that keeps you young. Children produce up to 10 times more melatonin than the elderly. And with age, you see a drop in the melatonin levels like we talked about. There is also less fluctuations in the hormones. You produce less melatonin and you start to experience fragmentation in your sleep and you lose a lot of the other longevity benefits of melatonin, such as antioxidant defense, detoxification pathways, autophagy, growth hormone, immune system, inflammation management, all those things are coordinated by melatonin in your sleep. 
So if your body doesn't produce enough melatonin because of aging or even because of artificial light exposure at night, then you're missing out on a lot of the most powerful and most easiest, let's say, repair mechanisms that happen in your sleep. Fortunately, it has been found that you can reverse the natural decline in melatonin production that happens with age. And the key metabolite for that is NAD. So NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, is this coenzyme in your body that coordinates a lot of longevity processes. And NAD also controls the circadian clock system. So it regulates the different hormones and maintains circadian rhythm alignment. Things that increase NAD naturally are calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, exercise, and just generally being aligned with the natural circadian rhythms, which is, you know, waking up in the morning and going to bed in the evening instead of having something similar to shift work, for example. Because shift work and circadian disruption, they break down the clocks, the circadian clocks inside your brain and start to inhibit the hormone production. And they also reduce NAD levels. And the same applies to inflammation and obesity and diabetes. So all the other metabolic, syn- uh, metabolic disorders and metabolic syndrome itself reduce your NAD levels and damage your circadian clock system. NAD production itself is linked to the circadian rhythms through an important enzyme called NAMPT. So NAMPT is this bottleneck in how much NAD your body is able to produce every day. And uh, NAMPT is dependent of SIRT1, SIRT2 in 1, which is a circadian gene. So the, let's say, overarching illustration of this is that if you have circadian rhythm alignment, then your SIRT2 wins are going to be activated. You also have the NAMPT bottleneck opened up or working properly, and you're able to increase NAD, and you're able to recycle NAD every day as it should be. And as a result, you experience increased health span and slower age-rated decline. Whereas if your circadian rhythms are misaligned because of shift work or jet lag or just having very irregular sleeping patterns, then the sirtuins are going to be offline as well. And MPT is blocked and you're not producing that much NAD and you start to age a lot faster. So the main circadian rhythm that humans have is the cortisol, melatonin, and diurnal rhythm. In the morning, you're supposed to produce a lot of cortisol to wake you up, to kickstart NAD recycling and the circadian rhythm alignment. For that, you need bright light exposure, maybe some physical movement, and things like that. But in the evening, cortisol levels are supposed to be low, and melatonin levels are supposed to rise to help with the rejuvenation in your sleep. And the things that inhibit melatonin, obviously, are going to be bright lights, artificial lights. But uh, even things like food too late may have a negative effect on the melatonin production. And if you look at the natural circadian rhythm of the light cycle, then the brightest time of the day is generally going to be around noon. And in the evening is going to be more dimmer, more amber and red light. So you should try to emulate this as much as possible. Try to get exposed to natural bright lights, or even if it's artificial lights, in the morning, throughout the day as well. But in the evening, dim down the lights, or use like more red, amber light bulbs. And of course, blue blocking glasses come in handy here as well, because they enable your body to still produce melatonin before bed when it's needed. The last tip, number five, is going to be collagen and glycine. So this, obviously, many people know that collagen is important for, like, wrinkles and joints and things like that. And it is true, with age, your collagen levels decline which is also part of one of the main reasons why you develop wrinkles and loss of skin elasticity with age. The collagen decrease can happen at a rate of about 10% per decade. And the skin collagen density also decreases 
at a similar rate, around 8 to 10% per decade. And uh, this is something that you can easily, of course, manage. You, it's also related to lifestyle factors, but with the loss of collagen, your skin pretty much starts to look more saggy. Collagen holds up kind of the fibroblasts inside the skin cells and uh, maintain the firmness and hydration and moisturization of the skin. And yeah, wrinkles are pretty much loss of collagen, damage the fibroblasts and losing moisturization inside the skin and elasticity. There are studies, a lot of them, that show that collagen supplementation does slow down the development of wrinkles and even reverse it. So uh, it is possible to pretty much like <laughs> reverse your skin age, at least with uh, collagen supplementation or getting more collagen into your diet. And with collagen, the most effective form is hydrolyzed collagen peptides. So normal collagen is like this cross-linked, let's say it's like a rope that is very strong and very elast elastic. But when you're digesting it, it gets broken down into the smaller peptides. These smaller peptides are able to reach the target tissue and they're more bioavailable, which is why, at least in all of the studies where they see a reduction in the skin uh, anti-aging or skin aging they use hydrolyzed collagen peptides so um, if i were ever to rely on trying to improve skin longevity or improve visible signs of skin wrinkles then i would use hydrolyzed collagen peptides because they're they've been proven to work in multiple human clinical trials collagen is composed of multiple amino acids three of them, and one-third of collagen is made of glycine. So glycine has many other health benefits, which we'll cover shortly, but to get the adequate amount of glycine for collagen turnover, you would need 12 grams of glycine a day. Now, three grams of glycine your body makes naturally, just by itself, but those three grams are generally going to be used for producing glutathione, the master antioxidant in the, in the body, creatine, which is this molecule for energy production, and heme. So if your body makes only three grams, and those three grams are going to be going for the essential functions that your body prioritizes, more so than wrinkles and collagen, then you will still have a 12 gram gap in your glycine demand for the day. So you would need to get at least 12 grams of glycine per day from various sources, supplemental and dietary sources, but the demand could even be up to 36 grams, depending on how much we think our glycine recycling rate is. So that's a bit of a debate. Some people think that the glycine recycling rate is 95%, which would mean that you would need only 12 grams of glycine per day. But there's also evidence that it could be 85%, which would mean that you need three times more glycine, so 36 grams. But generally, you would want to be eating foods that have glycine. If you take a collagen peptide supplement, for example, then 30% of that is going to be glycine. So 10 grams of collagen is 3 grams of glycine. But yeah, like glycine you can get from multiple kinds of foods like fish skin, chicken skin, pork skin, <laughs> different kinds of bones and ligaments. And uh, that's pretty much the highest source of glycine. Plant foods do have glycine. But you don't get like a lot of glycine from muscle meat, for example. So you want to, yeah, make sure that you increase your glycine intake from supplemental and uh, dietary sources generally. So glycine has many longevity benefits alone as well, beyond just the collagen. So glycine produces glutathione. It's the rate-limiting amino acid for producing glutathione. The other amino acids are glutamine and cysteine. But glycine is quite key there. Glycine has neuroprotective effects. It helps to protect the brain as well as the heart from oxidative stress through glutathione, but even through like lowering inflammation. It helps lower blood pressure because it's uh, 
GABAnergic amino acid helps to stimulate GABA, so you can use it before bed to relax, help with sleep, help with blood sugar reduction, and just overall heart health. So glycine, glycine like I said, is the rate-limiting amino acid for glutathione. Cysteine and glutamine are the other amino acids. And glutathione, you know, many people call it the master antioxidant, which is true. Glutathione has very important roles in reducing inflammation and oxidative stress. It has liver protective effects, neuroprotective effects, osteoprotective effects, and cardioprotective effects. And obviously you want to emphasize melatonin as well. Like I said, like I personally think that melatonin is like the kind of master <laughs> antioxidant. But glutathione obviously is very important as well. And glycine plus NAC is, I think, the most proven longevity supplement in humans, at least. There's at least, you know, I've, I've seen at least like five or six human clinical trials, which is the kind of the highest, let's say, um, quality of evidence, because it works in humans, not just rats or other animals. And uh, the glycine NAC combo has been shown to actually reverse hallmarks of aging and improve functional outcomes. So Glynac supplementation in the elderly has been seen to increase grip strength, increase walking speed, reduce blood pressure, reduce like the waist circumference even, and improve muscle strength and just have an overall restorative effect on the body through different kinds of hallmarks of aging. So if there is only like one supplement that you would ever take, then I personally would say that it's the glycine and NAC, especially in the elderly. It might not be as impactful in younger individuals. So like in your 30s and 40s, you might not benefit that much from glycine and NAC, at least in terms of the hallmarks of aging. But just adding more glycine into your diet or supplement routine, I do think has at least through collagen turnover anti-aging effects that it's going to improve like your skin longevity and reduce hallmarks of skin aging. That's been uh, well uh, proven. And uh, that's it from me. And uh, thank you for listening.